Reverend Dr. May Elise Cannon is the Executive Director of Churches for Middle East Peace and an ordained pastor in the Evangelical Covenant Church. Cannon holds a Master of Divinity and an MBA from North Park University and an MA in Bioethics from Trinity International University. She received her first doctorate of two in American history with a minor in Middle Eastern Studies at the University of California, Davis, focusing on the history of the American Protestant Church in Israel and Palestine. She is the author of several books, including the award-winning Social Justice Handbook, Small Steps for a Better World. Together, let's all welcome Reverend Dr. May Elise Cannon. Hello. I have been coming uh, to Palestine for a long time, and I had the privilege of living in Jerusalem uh, in 2010-2011, but I consider Beit Zahor my home. And this morning, I got so lost. I spent 45 minutes in the hills of Bethlehem, Beit Zahor, and I kept running into people, and my Arabic is only, I learned it on the streets of Jerusalem, so I can cuss and order wine which didn't do me much good in finding Bethlehem Bible College. So I kept just saying, Wayne Kanisa, Wayne Kanisa. And that's why it took 45 minutes. Uh, so if I um, had trepidation about the words I was going to share with you this morning, that didn't help center my spirit much. I'm grateful for the gift of being together, and it is a gift. Um, one of the things uh, that struck me, particularly during the time of Lent, I don't know about you, but over the past uh, eight months or so, when I experience joy, I feel guilty. I got one nod. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the passage that got me through um, that I think for me answers the question of what does it mean to be a Christian witness in the midst of oppression is Romans chapter 12. And it says, abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. And in some ways I think it's easier to abhor what is e evil because all I feel is angry. I keep speaking to churches and I just start yelling. And my husband says, Mace, you know, I'm doing this at home too, right? And he says, stop yelling at me. And I say, I'm not yelling at you, I'm just yelling. I'm so angry. But underneath that anger, my heart is broken. And so, um, I've given more than 100 talks, you know, since October. I'm not nervous about talking. And I was telling Jack, I've rewritten this talk 10 times. <laughs> and I don't have any wisdom. And I know that broken hearts is not enough. One of the prayers, I saw that Steve Haas is here, I think that he shared this prayer in 2010 or 2012 at Christ at the Checkpoint, but one of the prayers we often pray at World Vision is break my heart for the things that break the heart of God. The founder of World Vision used to pray that prayer. And I don't know about you, but if you really pray that prayer, that takes a lot of courage. Because my heart, my heart is not big enough. to hear the things that we hear each and every day and to see the things that we see each and every day and that the world is not abhorred. That on October 7th, there was a government that said, turn off the water, the gas, and the food, and the electricity of 2.3 million people and that the entire world was not in an uproar. My heart is not big enough to be that broken. And so the other prayer I've been praying is not only break my heart for the things that break the heart of God, but it's also God expand my heart. <laughs> um. 
Um, I have deep gratitude uh, for Bethlehem Bible College. On my own journey, you know, you heard about my master's degrees and my doctorates. And uh, when I first came here in 2009, I thought I knew a thing or two about the world. My first book was coming out, you know, I was getting a PhD. My former husband, the first one was a jerk, the second one's good. <laughs> My first husband used to always tease and say, master of all trades and doctorate of none. So I went and got two doctorates. I thought I knew a thing or two about the world. And when I crossed the Allenby Bridge and was standing in the West Bank, the Israeli Border Patrol said, are you going to the West Bank? And I said, no. What an idiot. And I'm an educated American. And what ignorance, right? And I had this book coming out. It was about three weeks before the book was to go to print. I had this book coming out about global justice issues. I did not name it Social Justice Handbook, The Audacity. You introduce yourself and you say, I wrote the book on social justice. The handbook, nonetheless. <laughs> I'm hearing all of the, I watched, I have not been with you the last couple of days, but I've been watching online and I'm hearing, you know, all of the words about white supremacy and colonialism. And here I stand before you as a white American woman, incredibly privileged, who wrote the book the social justice handbook, right? That's the exclamation mark on the end of that sentence. So I had this book coming out about global justice issues and I thought I knew a thing or two about the world. And I came here to see Israel and I came here to meet Jesus. And I did both of those things, but I also had a Damascus Road experience. I started to see signs that said free Palestine and the only Palestine I knew was this map in the back of my Bible. <laughs> and I started to have this, um, what's that word? I've lost, I, I don't know names, anybody who travels with me knows this, I know no names. I mean, I forget my husband's name, I forget my own name, so when I forget yours, don't be offended. And I don't know acronyms, um, but um, see, I even forgot what I was just saying. So, incongruity, what's the word for like when you have this like experience, you know? Thank you, that's the word. See, we're gonna preach together, like because I don't have it in me. So I had this, cogn that's the word, thank you. I had this cognitive dissonance and I had this book coming out about social justice and I came here to Bethlehem Bible College and I heard Bashar Awad tell the story of the Nakba and the Palestinian people and I just began to weep. I just wept the whole time he was talking. And if you come to my office in Washington, D.C., you'll see this picture. And there's this picture of me with tears in my eyes. And it was the moment. It was my Damascus Road experience where scales fell from my eyes. And I went to InterVarsity Press and I said, I cannot have a book coming out about global justice issues that does not mention Palestine. And they said, May, your book is 200 pages and it has an index and we can't, you know, you'd have to redo the entire book. It was like literally going to print. They said, we can't, we can't add Palestine. And I said, well, it can't go to print. So this went on and on and on. And so there's one line in Social Justice Handbook about Palestine and it's in the section about South Africa about apartheid. And it says, Jimmy Carter says, what's happening in Palestine? You know, it, it uses the title of his book, Peace Not Apartheid. That's the only mention in Social Justice Handbook about what's happening here. My point is, what does it mean to be a, a witness? It means to allow our hearts to be broken and for God to give us eyes to see. Witness is about eyes to see the oppression that is before us, but not only that, the role that we play in it. You know, the hard part about these prayers and the hard part about this message is that we as human beings can't face the reality 
of our own sin and our own contribution. Do you remember when Moses was on Mount Sinai? He could not see the face of God. It was too much for him. The passage in Exodus 33 tells us that in our own human frailty, we do not have the capacity on our own, for the glory of God is too much to handle. We both don't have the capacity to see the goodness of God, but also the truth about who we are in the midst of this story. And so the Lord gave Moses a greater revelation of his visible glory, which is the outward manifestation of God's character and nature. And so you'll recall that God said he would turn his back and allow Moses to walk by. God only reveals to us as much as, he, as we can handle. This, if you use Romans chapter 12, I'm not going to go through the whole passage, but it talks about by the grace that God gives us, right? And so if we pray for God's grace, guess what? It's not going to get easier. It's going to get harder, I promise you. This is the hardest work I have ever done. And I'm not saying that because I feel sorry for myself. I'm saying that because I don't have the courage to do it. I'm saying that because we have to admit the hatred within our own hearts. And friends, we have more hatred within us than we even know. And if we really want to be peacemakers and witness the oppression of the Palestinian people, we have to come to terms with that reality. And it is hard. It is so hard. It is, it is so much easier to be angry. How many of you know the Enneagram? If you don't know it, I'm sorry, look it up. I'm an eight. I'm a fighter. We fight everything. Uh, plus, plus, I'm Irish, so I'm an Irish eight on the Enneagram. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. You know, fighter, not a lover. Oh, I was speaking to this very, very, where's Jonathan Katab? I don't know if he's in the room. Jonathan and I. The church, the, the, the church, the church in New York, that we were speaking to this church, totally pro-Israel. These men shook my hand, and I thought my hand was going to break. And I started out talking to them about being a fighter and being Irish, and we talked together to this church about Palestine. There was a man that was going to leave the church just before we were going to come, before we even spoke. And we talked about God's ways not being our ways. And by the time we left, he said, maybe I was wrong about the story of Israel and Palestine. Fighting and being angry is a human way to deal with this issue. Do you know those verses that talk about in your anger, do not sin? I would much rather stay angry. It actually feels really good to yell sometimes. Do you know how much I was really going to cuss Jack, Sarah? I just restrained myself. I was... Do you know how good it feels to cuss right now? And I always use the justification that Jesus cursed the damn fig tree, because he did. <laughs> it feels so much better to be angry. And listen to me, please. I am not saying that anger is not justified. We should be angry. It doesn't say don't be angry. We should be angry. We should be more angry than we are. Why is the world not freaking ass angry? Why is the church okay being silent? I, we have been speaking to as many churches as we can speak to saying, don't be scared. Don't put your head down. Have courage. Please, please, please be angry. Children are dying. And the ones who aren't dying are being starved so much so that they are going to have mental disabilities for the rest of their lives. We should be more angry than we are. But in your anger, do not sin. I'm going to tell you a story. I have permission to share this story. Is Shireen in the room? Shireen Halal, oh, oh, right in front of me. Habibdi. <laughs> Miss May is gone. OK. OK. Little Mutter Yame. Uh, if you see a little Palestinian girl running around with the name tag May Cannon, that's Shireen's. <sighs> I was sitting in January at Shireen's uh, kitchen table, and I love her children like my own. And Palestinian mothers, how many Palestinian mothers do we have in the room? You are the heroes. You are the heroes of this conflict, raising your children to love and not hate. Yeah. 
and Shireen has been doing that with her kids. And little May, little May is a, a, you know, very industrious, so she asks Shireen to buy her candy from the store, and so lots of candy, lots of candy. And, and Shireen says, well, you can't eat all this candy. What do you want this candy for? So <laughs> May takes the candy to school and sells it for three or four times more than the candy costs. Now, lest you think she's just an entrepreneur and being selfish, guess what she's using the money for? She's using it for children in Gaza. And we're sitting at the kitchen table and we're talking about this, and we're talking about this beautiful little girl who they call May. And she says, I want the bombing to stop. I want the bombing to stop. And then she says, but I don't want the bombing of Israel to stop. I want, I want them to keep bombing Israel. And she didn't say that because she's hateful. She didn't say that because she's Palestinian and she's a terrorist. She said that because she's a little girl who lost two aunts, or an aunt and an uncle and another aunt that's been injured. She said that because she's in pain, this little girl. So I'm sitting at home a few months later, and I'm visiting a family member, or family members visiting. Anybody here from Texas? I always have to check before I tell stories about different states. This family member from Texas, a fundamentalist Christian. And, you know, I knew, you know, you kind of know where the story's going to go, right? Like, you know how it's going to go. And this story's actually not about his sin. It's about my own. And we're talking about these issues, and we're talking about what's happening. And he's asking all these questions, and he's not really listening. And I tell this story about Maria. And I tell the story thinking that he will have empathy for what these children are going through. That children in Gaza are asking, what's America going to give us today? Is it bread or is it bombs? Right? That our hearts should be broken for these children. And you know what he says to me after I tell him the story? He says, that proves my point. Look, Palestinians are full of hate. I wanted to kill that man. I had so much hatred in my heart. In my home. He said that about someone I love. So good. That's the message he got out of that story. And friends, if we want to be a witness to the oppression here, we have to deal with that hatred that is within us. And if we want to be really honest when we say break our hearts about the things that break the heart of God, our hearts should also be broken about what happened on October 7th. It was an atrocity against God. Now, I believe there's a microcosm and a, a macro, you know, a micro way to look at this and a macro issue. I agree 100%. I heard Shireen say the other night, this did not begin on October 7th. I agree. The context is important, 100%. But that Israeli mother or that international mother who lost a child that day, our hearts should be broken for them as well. And if we want to have Christian witness in the midst of our oppression, it does not minimize our calling for justice for Palestinians by speaking out against atrocities against Israelis. It actually strengthens our cause. That is the Christian message on the cross. The task of a leader is to carry the pain of your people. Now, do I know that October 7th brought attention to the struggle of the Palestinian people? Yes. And is there international law that allows for violent resistance against oppression if it's not against civilians? My understanding of international law, which is limited, but my understanding is that is a legitimate point of engagement, right? But as Christians, where would Jesus be? What does Jesus call us to? If you look at Romans 12, he talks about sacrifice. He talks about not only loving your friend, but loving your enemy. What does it mean? I am so sorry 
for the pain and suffering of the Palestinian people. And I am so sorry to bring this message because I promise you, I really don't want to be bringing it. <laughs> But friends, if our Christian witness is not different than a worldly witness, what kind of message do we have that points to Jesus? I've preached nothing that's in my notes. When you go to Romans chapter 12, it says, abhor what is evil. And boy, wouldn't it be nice if it was all evil on one side and all good on the other. And I know we in America really like for it to be that way. But it is not a binary. There is evil everywhere. And death and murder and killing and violence is evil against the image of God. Every human being is made in Imago Dei, the image of God. And we need to abhor what is evil. And not only that, we also need to cling to what is good. And it is good for us to be together. And it's good that when we see one another and it brings us joy, even in the midst of such atrocities and as we're working to prevent further genocide, and as this is the hardest work we're ever going to be called to do in so many ways, because friends, this is not about Palestine. This is about the witness of the church in the history of the world. This is not about the liberation of Palestine only, yes, but it's about the liberation of the gospel. This is about, is the good news of the gospel true? And where is the church in this moment? Where is the church? And is the church calling us to more, to more, to entering into that pain? to a sacrificial giving that costs so much. Why is it that secular college students who've never even been here are doing more than the church is doing? They're willing to give up their entire futures, their degrees, their futures. Why are they willing to sacrifice more than the body of Christ? What have we lost? Church, what have we lost? We have to return to Jesus not for the liberation of the Palestinian people, but for our own liberation, for the liberation of our souls. And the good news of the gospel is this, that it's for the liberation of all people who choose to follow. And, and it's, it's about physical oppression. I mean, ironically, the Jewish text that's being read in synagogues around the world at least for Reformed Judaism this week, is from Leviticus chapter 25. And I sometimes tease, I'm sure that's all of your favorite Old Testament passage. How many of you know what it's about? It's the year of Jubilee. It's Jesus' very first sermon where he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news, good news to the poor, freedom for the oppressed, recovery of sight for the blind. We're the blind people. The church are the blind. Might God open our eyes and might we not be so audacious to think that we have the uh, answers. You know, Romans 12 says, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought. I certainly have been guilty of that. Missed three master's degrees and two doctorates. And how many books? I'm still trying to keep up with Sun Chan Ra and Lisa Sharon Harper. <laughs> Might we submit ourselves to God? That passage also talks about doing that which God calls us to do. And the good news is God has called each of us uniquely and differently. We're each in different contexts. The scriptures talk about being obedient to God, not obedient to humankind, right? But we do that within the context of community. And so might God give us eyes to see might God break our hearts for the things that break the heart of God, but expand our hearts so that we have more capacity because of our own limitedness and our own weakness, right? 
Might we not think of ourselves more highly than we ought? And then might we be obedient to that which God has called us to do? And I promise you, he has equipped you to do it. He has given you what you need. I wake up every day and I don't feel that way. (laughs) And when you work every day and the situation on the ground gets worse, we have to hold on to the truth that the scripture says, hope is that which you do not yet see right? God will be faithful to the Palestinian people. I fundamentally believe that to be true. God will set the oppressed free. I fundamentally believe that to be true. So what role do we play in it? Be obedient to that which God has called you to do and do the hard, hard work, that soul searching hard work, that painful, painful work of being really, really honest of what within us needs to be rooted out. It's much easier to point at the other person, point at the person next to you. Tell them what needs to be rooted out in them. I've had quite a bit of that the last eight months, right? Do that hard searching work. And then by the grace of God, he will give us what we need. And the good news of the gospel is this, 2 Thessalonians 3, but the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord that what you are doing and will continue to do will be according to his command. May the Lord direct our hearts into God's love and into Christ's perseverance. Amen.